straighten this lad out. A thing like this could warp his mind for life. Another on the road special. Gotta know Joe Hobby. Hello. 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 Do I have a treat for y'all today? We uh, were heading to a uh, swap meet weekend, and we also stopped by and visited with a man by the name of Tommy Myers. I had bought a little toot or big toot, I can't remember, I think it was the uh, little toot RC plane uh, at, at a Texas Warbird Thunder. And one of my customers says, man, I know who built that plane. I said, get out of here. This uh, plane had been around a few years. He made a phone call and the next thing you know, Tommy Myers walks through my shop door because we wanted to reunite the two. Now, a lot of stories have been done about the big toots and the little toots and uh, Tommy Myers and, and George Myers and that's not really what I'm after here. Uh, Tommy's a great storyteller. It's really more about how these planes have brought many men and women together and kept them together and created legacy over the years. This is Tommy here. Tommy speaks highly of his father, Mr. George. And Mr. George and all the things he's done and all the things he's accomplished over the years, you're going to love these stories, I promise you. So sit back and enjoy Tommy, George, and the Toots. Now I got to tell you, Tommy wanted to have the plane in the background and who am I to, uh, the man was giving me a gift by talking. We were dealing with high winds, unfortunately we didn't get to fly that day, and also all this new equipment and I really, I didn't have a grip, I didn't have a cameraman, so uh, I also had some new lavalier mics that were digital that kept cutting out. So the audio that we have, we're lucky to have, as bad as it is, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go with it and I, I apologize. Please do your best to fight through. That was a, that was a challenge there, just for me to get to Dallas and get all that crap stuff. Yeah, where do you want this receiver? Right there's there, right. So, uh, if you hadn't figured out, we are in Dallas, Texas, and this beautiful thing behind me is at the uh, probably about the middle of its life because it's got a long, long oh, journey not, ahead of it. I'm sure, huh? It's just started. You know, so uh, the airplane's got about you know, 70 hours on it. Right. And we're talking with Mr. Tommy Myers. He is the son of a wonderful man, George Myers. And I heard some stories about this, this man and the admiration that uh, this man has for him. And uh, we talked, man, it must have been, what, two hours, if not longer. And, and, uh, yeah, it's it, too it bad was, I had to make it home. But uh, I, I told Tommy, I said, man, we've got to we've got to shoot some of this stuff so we can share these stories with some people. So, uh, so your dad, he uh, and I, let me let me pull up a couple of notes, and I, that's all I had time to do. Usually, I, I would be a lot more prepared for this, but I'm always unprepared, and uh, why would any, any this time be any different? Uh, let's see here. So your dad was born in 1960. Yeah, uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. And just to give people a little bit understand it. Mostly when they watch these videos, you, you say a year, they don't really grasp what's going on in America at that time. Uh, that was, you know, uh, there was there was two decisive battles going on in World War One at that time. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was our president. Uh, cars were extremely unreliable and the roads probably a little bit more. Model T was the thing that you'd see bouncing around in a, yep. you know, a mud pit. And then, and then this is when, when your dad come into the world in, in 1916. That's a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, where, where, was it Corpus? No, oh, he, he was born in St. Louis, Missouri. And when you talk about cars, he had an old, what they called a whippet. Yeah. I don't know whether it'd be Ford or what that was, but maybe, maybe it was a whippet. It may have just been a whippet. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, but my dad, uh, let me just let me just tell you the, the story I told you in Houston. Is uh, he was just inducted into the aviation uh, hall of fame down in his high school, down in Rittner High School in St. Louis, Missouri. And they invited me to be there for a presentation of that award. 
and I have part of it hanging on a wall over there. We'll show it to you later. Uh, this guy's going to drive right between us. That'll be all right. That's all right. Anyway. Uh, That's the excitement factor. Yeah. Anyway, he, uh, they asked me to come to St. Louis, so the whole family went up, and uh, they had a, a judge that went to the high school. He was this big judge, and he got up there, and he said, well, I'd like to thank the faculty and the student body, and he thanked everybody. And I'm sitting there going, well, I've got to follow that. So I got up there and I carried something in my pocket and I'll tell you what it was. Uh, I got up there and I said, you know, I, there's no way that I need to thank everybody for, for uh, inducting my dad into the Rittner High School Hall of Fame. But I want to tell you something. When my, my dad was 11 years old, Charles Lindbergh had just flown the Atlantic. Charles Lindbergh naturally flew an airplane called the Spirit of St. Louis. That's right. And uh, the Spirit of St. Louis was brought back on, the, on a, a ship, put back together, and Lindbergh flew it all around the United States celebrating his Cross the Atlantic tour. Well, one of the first places he went to was St. Louis and uh, Forest Park. Now, Forest Park is probably as big as the whole town of Louisville. And while my dad was there waiting for Lindbergh to fly over Forest Park, with the Spirit of St. Louis, he asked his mom to buy him a banner. You know, those triangular looking shaped banners? Pinnet, yeah, like little pennant things pinnet. that they had. They were yeah. real popular back it then. It said Lindbergh did it, Paris to, or New York to Paris in 33 hours and something minutes, and uh, was done on uh, 19, 1927. 27. And he'd have been 11. And I showed him, I pulled this banner out and I showed him this, this banner. And uh, I said, my dad told me that out of the 10,000 people that were in Forest Park, that he just knew Lindbergh was waving at him out the window. <laughs> and he was serious about yeah, it. Yeah. He's the only one that Lindbergh waved at him. Yeah. And so that's what got my dad interested in in model aviation, really, because he was uh, he was a craftsman from the word go. He built uh, museum quality model airplanes for a museum in St. Louis, and uh, he became a metalsmith uh, in St. Louis. And became a really really good metalsmith. That's why the original little toot looks the way it, the way it does in here due to wind noise uh, the cameras picked up now you have to remember these times there were no uh, telephones and TVs a lot of guys and gals never even left the farm that they lived on if they went to town it may have just been to town and no uh, the tail end of that you know we were living high, high cotton back you know uh, by the time it, you know of course you, you got a couple years on me but well I can remember 15 cent gasoline yeah I'm, you know, like, I'm not sure I'd like to see that again, but <laughs> I don't know. It probably well, might be a over. We but, may not ever but, you see know, that to again. see to see something uh, uh, just like to see an airplane for the first time, uh, especially one in person. You know, you didn't have them flying over all the time. I mean, they had to have been something that just reached down and, and, and grabbed him. You know, I mean, it was uh, like magic. Right. And it did. And Dad flew. Uh, he flew what they call high pylon free flight, endurance free, free flight. You know, they fire the engine up, it's running 20,000 RPMs, and the airplane goes straight up, and the dethermalizer lifts on it. No radio control stuff. Right. And then you chase them. So my dad was a free flighter that flew against Carl Goldberg and the Nationals. And you know, Goldberg, Goldberg put out all these kits and all these models, so dad and Goldberg were great friends. And they Were could, they about the same age? I, you know, I don't. No, know. I can't tell you that. I don't. I don't really know. But Dad. Is that classified, or you just no, don't remember? No, no, I don't. I wouldn't know. I, don't, I never knew that. But yeah. uh, his goal was to beat him in the nationals, and he did finally. And uh, I couldn't tell you which nationals it was. I have all the trophies at home. But uh, 
Well, what did your pops do? Uh, so, you know, he, he obviously got bit by the, the modeling bug, and, you know, that probably, you know, that and, and putting hay in the barn probably took up a lot of his life. You know, what was his next move? Well, <laughs> he was, uh, my dad was a maintenance guy for the famed Blue Angels as a civilian. Really? Yes, sir. Wow. When they were in Corpus Christi. And the Blue Angels had moved from Pensacola, Florida to Corpus and then back to Pensacola. Well, we didn't move from Pensacola to Corpus, but we dang sure moved from Corpus to Pensacola. And he was ahead of the Navy O&R, and the civilians really uh, did a lot of work on the Blue Angels, along with the normal maintenance people for those airplanes. That's a, a tremendous it undertaking is. for yeah. a few Navy people to well, do. How did he get to that, uh, to, to that point? What was he doing? As a, sheet as metal a work. Sheet, okay. He's so, sheet, okay. Sheet metal all the way. He, and if you really look at the original little tube, all the cowling, bug eyes and everything is all sheet metal built with a planishing hammer. Right. And old, an English school, wheel yeah, and all yeah. that stuff. It's a, the little tube has very little fiberglass on it. It's got fiberglass on it, Tommy Meyer put it on there because <laughs> I couldn't do the sheet metal work. But, you know, he, he more than anything in, in his whole lifetime, he said, oh, I didn't go to college and I don't have an engineering degree, but I think I could build my own airplane. Sure. And so he was also a jeweler. He learned that from his cousin Ralph who incidentally flew with Lindbergh, and I have pictures to prove that. And uh, so Dad built these museum models. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build a museum quality model of the airplane that I want to build. Okay. Little two. And uh, so I have a model at home I can show you. It's in a trophy case of a little two model. It's about this big that everything in it works. And he figured out all the aileron throws, all the rudder throws, all the, all the bell cranks, everything is in that model, but it's only this big. And he transferred that information up to the full size area. So did he, do you think he, uh, uh, oh, you, you know, did he try to put himself in positions to, to, to be around this since that bug got him, you know, once, you know, the model didn't seem to, you know, fulfill his. Oh, no, 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 that's incorrect. Uh, modeling was his life. And and therefore, you know that I, I'm a four-time national model airplane champion. Yes, sir. And why am I a four-time national model airplane champion? Because uh, I had a dad right. that helped me tremendously. Right. I got all the credit. I see. But my dad, yeah. if without my dad, I would have never done that. I have to give him all the credit in the world. But... He had me, when we were in Pensacola, he had me build an airplane called the Loaning Amphibian. And I got pictures I'll show them to you. You'd have to because I've never seen it or heard of it. <laughs> well, it, there's a tremendous story there. and We're bouncing around all yeah. over everything. Well, let me let you go then. You well, it's three in the morning and I'm gonna wrap this up. And this concludes the first part of the Toots and the Myers. I hope you have enjoyed this portion as much as I have. Again, I apologize for the audio. I had three cameras running, an actual video camera, two DSLRs, and a new digital lab mic setup. And I didn't have a cameraman or a grip, so every 20 minutes uh, or actually every 30 minutes my DSLRs would shut down and quit doing video because that's the window that they give you is a 30 minute window and you have to reset it or something so you don't burn up the internal uh, so playing this hat trick uh, was not easy and uh, with all the wind and the metal clanging around it just made it real, real tough Again, I apologize, and I'm not sure what the audio is like on all of it yet, but we're still working on it and trying to get it cleaned up as much as possible and save what we can. 
Y'all look for episode two coming soon. Got to know Joe Hobbies here at Spring, Texas.